DiscerningHearts.com, in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, presents A Sister of St. Therese, Servant of God, Leone Martin, Bearer of Hope, with Father Timothy Gallagher. Father Gallagher is a member of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, a religious community dedicated to retreats and spiritual direction, according to the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola. He is featured on several series found on the Eternal Word television network. He's also the author of numerous books on the spiritual teachings of St. Ignatius of Loyola and the Venerable Bruno Lanteri, founder of the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, as well as other works focused on aspects of the spiritual life. A Sister of St. Therese, Servant of God, Leone Martin, Bearer of Hope, with Father Timothy Gallagher. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Now, this is July 20th of this year, 1895, and she's 32, that she returns home, well, returns to live with the Gerens. Three weeks later, the younger daughter of the Gerens, Marie, enters the Carmel in Lisieux. And I just wonder what this must have meant for Leonie. Three times she's tried and failed, and here is this younger cousin now, just a few weeks later, after she's, Leonie has returned in such humiliation. Uh, is leaving the home to enter the Carmel, what that must mean for her. At this point, too, Celine is already in the Carmel. And now in the following year, 1896, this is the next to last year of Therese's life, she has that hemorrhage of blood on Holy Thursday and Good Friday. This is the the signal that her health is going to take a, a significant downturn. And Leonie will will witness this through her visits to the Carmel as all of this unfolds. So she is living with her aunt and uncle, 33, 34 years and so on in in these years. And she's struggling. She's very much loved by them. But uh, their life was different than that of the Martins. They were much more socially active. And um, her uncle had come into a very rich inheritance at this point and had a very large property with a a large mansion out in the country. And they would spend the summers there with all kinds of social activities and games and parties and things. And all of this was very hard for Leonie, who just never really felt at home in any of this and knew that uh, the others saw her as not fitting well into this. So these are sad and painful years in in the life of Leonie. She does her best, but it's difficult. Let's look at a letter written from Therese to Leonie. It's almost exactly a year after she has left the visitation convent. Dear little Leonie, I would have answered your charming letter last Saturday, Sunday if it had been given to me, but we are five, that is, the four sisters and their cousin now are in the Carmel. And you know that I am the littlest, she's the youngest. So I run the risk of not seeing the letters until after the others, or else not at all. I saw your letter only on Friday, and so, dear little sister, I am not late through my own fault. Now, this is just uh, invariable in Therese. Leonie will be wondering, why haven't I heard from Therese? And so she goes into some detail to explain this, so that Leonie will know that there was no lack of, of love for her involved in this. I am not surprised that the thought of death is sweet to you since you no longer hold anything on earth. This is a a theme throughout Leonie's letters that the uh, earth, as we've talked about this before, earth as exile, heaven as the homeland and the end of suffering. And I think it's quite easy to understand why Leonie would long for the end of this exile at this point in her life when she seems to have reached a kind of dead end and there seems to be nowhere, no way forward. I assure you, and this, uh, these next sentences are why I wanted to quote this letter. Uh, sweet to you, since you no, no longer hold on to anything on earth. I assure you that, I assure you, look at the, the uh, certainty uh, with which Therese speaks. Uh, at this point, she is at the height of her sanctity and the depth of the richness of her doctrine. These are the, are the years also in which she's writing the story of a soul. I assure you that God is much better than you believe. At one point, I took that sentence in the original French and wrote it out just so I could see it. Well, I'll complete it. I assure you that God is much better than you believe. 
he is content with a glance, a sigh of love. We can be afraid of God. You know, sometimes when we look at just how imperfect we are or, you know, in mid-afternoon or toward the end of the day, you look back at how we've lived the day and I wasted time there and I missed that opportunity there and my prayer was so sketchy. And somewhere um, on the margins of our spiritual consciousness is a sense that the Lord can't be very happy with this. Must be a little disappointed with me and so on. And, and you can see Leonie living all of this very deeply at this point when she feels such a f- failure. And so Therese says, I assure you, and let's let her speak to the hearts of every one of us listening right now. I assure you that God is much better than you believe. It's not as hard as you think. He's not as critical as you think uh, and criticizing as you think he is. He's not as quick to point out and to put his finger on faults and failures as you think he is. He's much better than you think he is. He is content with a glance, with a sigh of love. And I think that's really why this sentence struck me so much because, all right, maybe I didn't do that well, but I can lift my heart to the Lord and just say, with all my failures and faults, you know that I really do want to love you. And he's content with that. That's all he's asking with a sigh of love. And we can all do that. As for me, I find perfection very easy to practice. Remarkable. Well, we're we're at the heart of Therese here now. Perfection is her way of saying holiness or sanctity. As for me, I find perfection very easy to practice because I have understood that it is a matter of taking hold of Jesus by his heart. This is very deep in her doctrine. So she explains, Look at a little child who has just annoyed his mother by flying into a temper or by disobeying her. I, I would um, I would ask, or I'd like to, to invite uh, any mothers listening just to see how you respond to what Therese says here. So here's a little child who has just bothered or annoyed his mother. He's gotten into a temper or a sulking or disobeyed or something. If he hides away in a corner in a sulky mood, And if he cries in fear of being punished, his mama will not pardon him, certainly not his fault. But if he comes to her, holding out his little arms, smiling and saying, Kiss me, I will not do it again. Will his mother be able not to press him to her heart tenderly and forget his childish mischief? However, she knows her dear little one will do it again on the next occasion, but this does not matter. If he takes her again by her heart, He will not be punished. And again, we could spend a long time on that. I assure you that God is much better than you think. At the time of the law of fear, before the coming of our Lord, the prophet Isaiah already said, again, as I say, you you never go far without scripture in Therese. Speaking in the name of the king of heaven, can a mother forget her child? Well, Even if a mother were to forget her child, I myself will never forget you. What a delightful promise. And this was in the time of the law of fear before Jesus came, she's saying. Ah, but we who are living in the law of love in the New Testament after Jesus came, how can we not profit by the loving advances our spouse is making to us? How can we fear him who allows himself to be enchained by a hair fluttering on our neck, these small little gestures of sacrifices and reaching out and so on. Again, quoting the Song of Songs. Let us understand then how to hold him prisoner, this God who becomes the beggar of our love. When telling us that it is a hair that can affect this prodigy, now she explains what the image means. He is showing us that the smallest actions done out of love, so there's the heart of the little way, are the ones that charm his heart. You, Leonie, can do that. And really, as a doctor of the church, she's saying that to every one of us. Ah, if we had to do great things, how much we would have to be pitied. But how fortunate we are since Jesus allows himself to be enchained by the smallest things, which opens up sanctity to every one of us. It is not little sacrifices you lack, dear Leonie. Is not your life made up of them? And this is why she's saying it to you, to her, There's the sadness in Leonie's life. There's so many things that she's asked to participate in or do in a day that she really doesn't want to do and are difficult for her. her. 
So you have so many opportunities to offer these kinds of little sacrifices to the Lord. I take delight at seeing you before such a treasure. Uh, these are Therese's reversals, as I call them. Call them. So here is Leonie burdened by the sadness of living in a situation that she really doesn't want to live in, to live in and which is hard. And Therese turns it around and says, how blessed you are to be in a situation which allows you to offer these things for the Lord and so to win his heart. I take delight at seeing you before such a treasure, and especially when thinking you know how to profit from it, not only for yourself, but for souls. That apostolic uh, purpose, evangelizing, bringing others to Jesus, is always very, uh, at, very much at the heart of this whole little way. Why do we do these things? Because through them, we help Jesus. We are, we, we are associated with Jesus in his work of redemption and bringing his grace to others and changing lives. To help him save souls that he bought at the price of his blood and that are awaiting only our help in order not to fall into the abyss. It seems to me that if our sacrifices are the hairs which captivate Jesus, our joys are also. So it's not just the sad things, it's the happy things too. For this, it suffices not to center in on a selfish happiness but to offer our spouse the little joys he is sowing on the path of life to charm our souls and to raise them to himself. And then she goes on with some more immediate family matters. And then I'll read one more letter of Therese to Leonie. And this is the last letter that she wrote to Leonie. Leonie, of course, kept it with the others. And she'll quote this letter later on in some of her own letters. This was precious to her. It was like, Therese's final testament, almost, uh, in a way, to her. This was not the last communication of Therese to Leonie, because although it was the last time she was able to write to her, so this is July 17th, she died September 30th, but she had that extremely painful month of August, and uh, writing was just very difficult for her in those final weeks. But uh, let me read this, uh, the editor includes this. This is actually Leonie herself writing to Céline, a number of years later. You know that a few days before her holy death, Therese had written to me by means of our dear sister Marie of the Sacred Heart, that if I wanted to live by love and humility, she would come to get me. That's a quote. And I am begging her to help me and not to forget her promise. So this was not the final communication of Therese to Leonie, but it's the last letter. Dear Leonie, uh, I am very happy to be able to speak with you again. A few days ago, I was thinking I no longer had this consolation on earth. Uh, she thought that her death was already imminent. But God seemed willing to prolong my exile. There's that always that theme, I exile a little. I am not disturbed by it, for I would not want to enter heaven one minute earlier by my own will. The only happiness on earth is to apply oneself in always finding delightful the lot Jesus is giving us. And that will mean an awful lot for Leonie as the years unfold. The only happiness on earth is to do what Jesus wants us to do. The only happiness on earth is to apply oneself and so to make the best effort we can in always finding delightful the lot Jesus is giving us. And then to Leonie. Your lot is so beautiful, dear little sister. This 33-year-old woman whose life seems so ended and over and sad. If you want to be a saint, this will be easy for you. Since at the bottom of your heart, the world is nothing to you. You can then, like us, that is your sisters in the Carmel, occupy yourself with the one thing necessary. Scripture always returns. That is to say, while you give yourself up devotedly to exterior works. So she is doing her best to reach out to help and so forth. While you're doing this, your purpose is simple, to please Jesus. So as we said before, that's the deep thing. To please Jesus, to unite yourself more intimately to him. You want me to pray in heaven to the sacred heart for you. Be sure that I will not forget to deliver your messages to him and to ask all that will be necessary for you to become a great saint. And she underlines a great saint. 
Adieu, dear sister. I would like the thought of my entrance into heaven to fill you with gladness, since I shall be able to love you even more, which is a lovely thought. The final thing that she says to her sister, don't be sad at my death, because from heaven I'll be able to love you even more than I've ever loved you before, which again is speaking right to the need in Leonie's heart. And then the rest then of this is Therese's own story, the final months, the last conversations, and then the moment of her death on September 30th, that powerful last glance that lasts about the length of a credo, as they say, when uh, the sisters just, it's apparent to them that something supernatural is taking place and that holy death which ends that holy life. So this is in September of 1897. In the following year, her sisters, especially Pauline, prepare the three manuscripts that put together have become the story of a soul. And they publish it on the first anniversary of her death. So this is September 30th, 1898. Their uncle actually finances the publication of 2,000 copies of this book, which is really how the whole saga of Therese after her death begins. Leonie reads this. And it's a bombshell for her. It's another turning point in her life. She learns, of course, she was never there in the Carmel with the other sisters, like her other sisters, to see Therese go through the years of the Carmel. And Therese shares a number of things about her earlier life, too, which Leonie had never known. So she devours this book. It becomes, as it, so to speak, her bedside reading. She goes, reads it over and over and over again. And it is fundamental in her absorption of Therese's little way, opening up to her the path that will be hers for the rest of her life. A few more months go by after this, and it becomes apparent that to everyone that Leonie wants to make a further effort to enter religious life. And she is in communication with the monastery of the Visitation Sisters in Caen, And something has happened since she left. The harsh regime has been replaced now by a much, the people in charge now have a much more, I would say, Salesian, that is uh, based on Francis de Sales' own gentleness and goodness, approach to formation and to their religious life. And in fact, a number of those who were Leonie's companions, as I mentioned, all of them had to leave the novitiate at that time, a number of them are beginning to return with uh, a hope that they can now live in the religious life in the new way things are being done. And Leonie is aware of this, and this unshakable desire in her that was there from very early on, as we've seen, to become a religious uh, awakens to a new hope again. She determines that she's going to make a further effort to enter religious life. And in fact, uh, she does this the following January. So. This is, what is it, it's about four months after the, the story of the soul is, is published and she reads it. And that leads us into the, I guess I'd call it the third phase in Leonie's life. The first phase we saw through the eyes of a saint, Zélie. The second phase, in some sense, we've seen through the lives of a second saint, and that is Therese. The third phase, we will again see through the lives, I'll say, of a, of a third saint, although I don't want to anticipate the church on this, so I'll put that between quotation marks, but certainly one whose cause of canonization is underway, and that is Leonie herself, now the servant of God, Leonie. So we will see this primarily through her own letters at this point. I just want to say on behalf of the audience, I think, and our listeners, good for her going back and giving it another try. I know that there's more to the story, but especially since there was that change, and then they were obviously, there was communication amongst those who returned and, and her potentially. And, but yeah, I mean, how often do we just give up? Begin again, begin again. Begin again. Yes, you know, we said from the start, we quoted a letter both of her aunt, uh, Sister Marie Docité, and then similar words in a letter from Zélie, where they mentioned that this little one has a will of iron. When she sets her goals on something, no obstacle is too much for her. 
She will brush aside every obstacle until she gets her goal. And you see it here. Leonie, if she is a figure of inspiration in many other ways, one of the ways also in which she is an inspiration is that she is the figure of perseverance. She is the one who will not let herself be defeated, who suffers her defeats and humiliations, and the tears are there and the sadness, but who never gives up. And this is one of the powerful lessons in her life. So yes, I'm so glad that you highlight that there. That's one of the, I doubt that many of us will ever face as many obstacles as she did. And she never gave up. In some ways, I may be guilty of being melodramatic, I suppose, maybe because I've just fallen in love with her over the course of our conversations about her life. But she's experiencing the way of the cross. She falls and she encounters her mother. And then she falls and she encounters, you know, her Veronica, who is her sister. And she gets up again and she just keeps moving. And as with all saints and with all of us, it leads to our Calvary. We all will carry whatever we need to carry in this lifetime to that point where we end up having that moment. And when you use the word perseverance, so many of us, when we pray the rosary and that fifth mystery, pray for the virtue of perseverance, the grace of final perseverance. Good for her. Yes, I'm so glad you, uh, you highlight that for us. And what that points out is that we are never defeated in the spiritual life. As we said before, sometimes God may close one door, but it's because he has another door open for us elsewhere that we may not yet see. So when the door to the poor Clarice is closed, it's because God has something else in store. But that's very different from feeling defeated. It's over. I can't hope anymore in the spiritual life. And Leonie's life is a powerful witness to that. So since we've raised this, I would say that if any of us listening have any of that feeling anywhere in our relationship with God or living of our vocation, that I can't hope for as much anymore, or I'm defeated, and that's sadly just where it's going to stay, then let Leonie's example speak to that. Because if ever anyone could have, I would say in human terms, reasonably said, I am defeated, I tried once, I tried twice, I tried three times. It never worked out. Uh, Leonie, of course, would have had every reason to say that, and she never did. And so here we see her trying again for a fourth time. We'll continue this conversation with Father Gallagher in our next episode. You've been listening to A Sister of St. Therese, Servant of God, Leonie Martin, Bearer of Hope with Father Timothy Gallagher. To hear and or to download this episode, along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com, or you can find it on the Discerning Hearts free app. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission, and if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax-deductible, to help support our efforts. But most of all, we hope that you will tell a friend about discerninghearts.com and join us next time for A Sister of St. Therese, Servant of God, Leonie Martin, Bearer of Hope, with Father Timothy Gallagher.